All right, Twinkle Toes himself, Ed Nomani, is with us. Good afternoon, how are you? Thank you. How's Very it going? Good. All in good, George. How do you, how do you find being uh, defined as a dancer as opposed to a footballer these days? It's kind of a, it's a bit of a worry, really. Do you know, if you're after giving um, 14 or 15 years of your life to G and then all of a sudden you do 12 weeks of dancing and you're known as Ed Nomani, the dancer, instead of a footballer, it's a, I think it's a bit of a worrying sign. Yeah, uh, people are quite more than happy to... to uh, obviously, because you were good at it. That was the mistake, that was the mistake you made. I enjoy something else. I'm, I'm more than just a footballer. Yeah, I think at the start, I think I went in as a like a statue, um, very rigid, and I, I think I was trying to explain to, the, I suppose, the judges and everyone else there that the whole GA background, like that, you need to be kind of, um, you need to have that kind of statue when you're playing GA, and I suppose the way it's come on now and, and it's gone so professional that uh, you, you can be kind of a, a small kind of minogi on to pitch, like so. Yeah, it was kind of hard to break down. I had to stay out of the gym for two or three months, and uh, why? Because you. Because I suppose to, to get the kind of movement in your hips and stuff and um, like when I finished I'd lost the stone and a quarter. I don't know, was that for this, because of the stress of it now or the... Finished the dancing, you lost the stone and a yeah, quarter. Yeah, lost the right. stone and a quarter, yeah. And I actually, if, if I'd done that dancing maybe 10 years ago, my feet had been a lot quicker because I'm back playing club football and it seemed to have sped me up some bit. But um, yeah, it, it was just, uh, I suppose, it was totally different to football in that you're seeing different parts of your body that you, you'd never use in a pitch. Like, I spend most of my career probably running through people instead of running around them, and this was different, that you're, it's all in your hips and stuff, and your movement, which it's it's very interesting, like, and fitness-wise, it was amazing, like, you're yeah. rehearsing seven or eight hours a day, and you're constantly on your feet, like, so... Yeah, I mean, obviously, you were semi-professional slash professional for those 12 weeks, but, like, in retrospect, were you too heavy as a footballer? Like, did you do too much in the gym, and would you have been better to be a lighter, leaner, faster version of yourself? Yeah, I think maybe, I, I know myself, looking back in 2009, 2010, um, I'd have gone from starting in, on, on the, the first team to being sitting on the bench, and I suppose after being in all Ireland finals for five or six years before it, it was, a, I suppose, a different position for me. And uh, at the time, I found it tough, which any player would do, and just being honest about it, like you, you, it is a tough place to be when you're looking in and you're trying to find form and you're, you're asking questions about yourself. And... At times, I suppose, you can become selfish in your kind of saying, you, you'll be blaming everyone else yeah. instead of looking at the obvious things that are stating back on you. And, um, yeah, look, looking back there now, I probably did too much in the gym. Um, not make it, leave it as an excuse, but I suppose coming down the line then, I kind of, I found myself that I found a happy medium where I was doing my gym work and, like, it's gone, it's gone very big now into flexibility and mobility and... Yeah. You know, like, even I was talking to someone out today about Crow Park and they were saying about standing on the pitch and the size of it and they were coming from a rugby background and I was saying, like, it's, it's a pitch that has no place to hide. You know, you might get away with it in league games and stuff like But I think football has changed, you know, I think it's gone back to the more athletic build. But yeah. at the same time, you need to be conditioned and you need to have that strength work done, I suppose, pre-season where you haven't the legs that you're, you're using longer down the line. Yeah, that, that, that is, there was definitely a period of time, like you remember the Armagh lads and the, the shorter jerseys just to kind of accentuate exactly how big they got, but they, they got too big and they didn't, it seemed in retrospect that they didn't fully express themselves as footballers because they were too busy being huge and trying to crush did you guys get sucked into that as well as a, as a group or was that just a personal thing? I don't think we got sucked into it. I think that um, any time any team wins in Ireland, I think the the other teams, I won't say follow suit, like, but they try to do something. There's a bit of copycat. Yeah, yeah, there's a bit of copycat. I think the, the Amat lads that time, I think that was a more of a mental thing, you know, I suppose, for teams coming out against them that they, they might feel inferior, like when you're coming out, look at these, I suppose, physical players, I suppose, yeah. with the tight jars. And then, then I think football has changed now and I suppose the youth has changed as well, where they all like wearing the skin tight jerseys yeah. and, you know, like I think fitness now is the new social scene, like, so you've, you've all the skin tight jerseys and uh, I know I, I can't fit into some of myself, like, but I think that's the way football is going. And, um, yeah, I think there is, you, you definitely need to be conditioned as a player now because, like, you look at the rugby now and, like, I always said, they're, they're, when they, the impacts there are like car crashes, but at the same time, football, like, lots of players you see in there, they're the same kind of conditioning. Obviously yeah. not as, I suppose, heavy, more carry more weight w w as you'd need for the rugby, but in football terms, like, they, these athletes are conditioned. You even look at the Dublin lads there, like, they're serious, like, they're, like, professional athletes. They're more explosive now than, than big, and it's funny, you talk about rugby, like, there's definitely been a trend. The All Blacks bulked up in the middle of the last decade, but for the last World Cup, they slimmed down significantly. They're, they're, they decided they wanted their pack to be lighter and leaner and more mobile because, actually, like that, the pitch is huge. You should use the whole pitch. You can't do that if you're carrying too much muscle. Yeah, so like, I, like the way I look at it now, and I, I start to coach your team myself this year, um, 
I suppose when you start out with a team and if they have no background in, in, in weights or anything, you're always going to get that positive impact that when you put them into a gym first, obviously you should be careful because you don't want them to get injured. Yeah. But at the same time, you need to have conditioning. You need to have conditioning in the legs. There's no point having a guy running 20 laps in the pitch and then he's coming out into a championship game and he's getting blown away that he's marking some guy that's running through him constantly. And that that is the way the football has gone now. And Dublin played that game where they hug the touch lines and they kick ball in. There's runners coming at it. Like, so you have the likes of Jack McCaffrey and James McCarthy. Like, if you're standing at them and you're maybe 10 or 11 stone, then you're not going to last long with them. You yeah. need to be conditioned. You need to have that balance right. And um, I think, it, like, from, for me looking at now, I think it's a great time to be a player because you have you've that professional setup. Like, it's an amateur game, but you have that professional setup that you're, look, it's seven days a week. And you you hear everyone going, but the fun is going out of it and the fun element is going out of it. Like, for me, it's looking in like it's. You either want to be there or you're not. Yeah. Uh, you, you either want to put on a carriage or there, you want to put on a Dublin jersey or you don't. And it's, the, do you know, players have that option. There's not a gun to put to their head. But the, when you're talking about seven days a week and, and going to the gym, you would be doing that, it turns out, anyway. Right? That, that was actually something that appealed to you from the start. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it was, and um, I, I think I find I've more time now that I've retired from Kerry because you don't have your rest days. Yeah, but it, it was, and like I found that there was always something special when you're inside with a team like that. That whether you're going to the gym or something, you have that kind of you're like you're, you're like you're like you're in cotton wool, and there's that bond there that when you're in the gym and when you're on the pitch, you're always thinking about football. It's all football, and it's a selfish thing as well from a player's point of view. I suppose it's it's very selfish, but you have to be. I suppose if you're trying to win all Ireland. You have to put nearly the football before everything, and mm. um, that, that was the levels it got. To. And um, look, if I'm looking back and now, and if I look back, like I'd never talk about what I've won. I look back about the hard training sessions, you know, the 400 meter runs, or if you get the mountains and stuff like that. They are the the memories you'll take with it, and it's nice to be having to having to be able to be in that position because I know there's a lot more people that would love to be there. Yeah, but I was just fortunate to be there. I, so I'm I'm always interested in this because people do say you know the the fun has gone out of it. You're indentured slaves is the is the famous phrase, um, but there are it seems to be so many of you who would happily be a part of that lifestyle. It just so happens you're also really good football and in the company of elite footballers, like, which is, it sounds kind of stupid, right? But do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know. What that you like, mean, if like there were ten lads in your town who were all committed to yeah. doing this, you would be friends with them because you happen to all have the same patterns. Yeah, and I think like like what you're saying there. I always say, you know, with young kids, that there's that social aspect when you're involved in sport like that. Whether it's any sport, it's it's a great thing for kids growing up, and. Football wise, I know people talk about like yeah, you're you're a slave to GA, but like, and they talk about the oh, it's fine for the carries or the Dublins because they're in the final or semi final every year. And what about the so called weaker teams? Oh, I know plenty of players that are are training with the so called weaker teams, and then they train with them in the same principle that they're putting on a county jersey. And like it's not the cliche of oh, you're looking at who are before you. For me, like I didn't look at it that way. I look at it as a privilege, and like uh, even and the, the lifestyle choice as well. And, and like you choose this. There is there is an amazing lifestyle choice. Like you know you've. You're, as I said, no, you, you're, you're a professional at, at, athlete uh, playing an amateur sport and, it, and you have that choice whether you want to play or not. And for me, looking at now, I don't bother the players. I don't want to be texting saying who's going well here. I was fortunate to have my own time there. Like, and now looking in, like you're kind of, you're always wondering. And, and it's amazing. Like, I know going to the league games now, I'm base blown really, so I, I get in free. I can <laughs> send my guard uh, watching the games. But, um, it's great to see the young lads coming through, like, and uh, just the condition they're in, like, and, and I can see it from them. They're, they're, they're loving that life as well. When you joined the Kerry panel, had you already been a fitness fanatic the whole way through? Like, were you that way, 12, 13, 14, 15? Or did, is this something that kind of you realised, ooh, I need, to get, I need to hit the gym properly if I'm going to make it here? Yeah. So I suppose when I started at first, I started playing football when I was 12, and I would have had, I'd have had severe asthma growing up. And from... I'd say 12 to 15 or 16 for me I could have walked away from sport very easily that time because I was like your typical player you know, and someone coach says to you run around there for 15-20 minutes and get your second wind like when you're asthmatic you could be waiting 40 minutes yeah. and for me the fitness side of it then it kind of clicked that fitness and sport and obviously the GA that I was training so much was actually beating the asthma side of it and even to this day and um when I came in then to, I suppose, Kerry first, I played minor, I broke my nose, I missed the month's final, came back and I came on again in all Ireland's semi-final. I think Kerry were playing Dublin the same year, in nine, or Kerry were playing Kildare in 98, and came on a bumside in Crow Park, and it was like, the young lad from the country you now coming into Crow Park, looking around, like, you know, it was just amazing. And then, you just got an appetite for it, then I wanted to be on the Kerry panel, and I came in then in 2002 and three, and I remember a game of party, <laughs> and... 
we the, our first night going back, I, I, it was after a league or uh, after a college game, and we used to do a thing where we'd be in a small pitch beside the main pitch and up the hill and down. And the first eight runs, I was flat to the mat out the front. I was saying, really laying down a marker here and off myself. Then there was eight more, and then there was eight more, and I could see myself further getting back and back. And then I was on the very end of the panel at the back, and I came down. I was like, oh jeez, I was kind of rubbing the leg, and I'd say, Paul, it's uh, my hamstring is gone. He said nothing and. Grand going into the dressing room, came back two nights later. How, how's the hamstring? And I said, uh, oh, I said it's a lot better. And he said, I, I'd say you blew the head gasket, which I did. And it was it was a good learning curve. And I was too light back then. And I think back then it was a case of going away to the gym there and, and do yeah. your own thing. And then 2004, uh, Jack came in and Pat Flanagan, Flanagan came in us and Pat was the first guy that had introduced me to weights. I remember even that year we played Aller, uh, May on the Aller in final. And the week of the game, myself and Mike McCarthy were inside in the gym the Tuesday and Torres in the Glen Eagle in Killarney, flat smack doing, doing, doing weight sessions. Yeah, yeah. because you know, do you know, and like it didn't reflect on the pitch or anything, as in didn't take away from our play, but it was just could like, have done. Uh, it, it could have, yeah, you know. yeah. <laughs> it could have, yeah, but yeah, and that was the start of it. And 14 years on, you've, I've seen everything and anything, do you know, and it doesn't, there seems to be new craze. Every year or every time, it, and a team does something else. Everyone's looking at what's the strength and conditioning coach doing. And I yeah. even see Galway now last year. You know, a lot of people are saying the conditioning they were in. And I see the, the physicality they have, especially in their forwards and their midfield. You know, everyone wants to know like what's the yeah. secret. Yeah. I mean, it's it's big lads who have trained a lot and who are very intense mm. in their tackle. That's yeah. what that's but really what they had. At the same time, then like you you need to be. I think the last I suppose of football thing now has gone into these small sided games, and yeah. I think people like and I know myself. I'm like I'm doing strength and conditioning now at the moment. They like to hear the craze that we've new coach in there and he's doing all small set of games and there's no hard running. No, my belief in it, and this is only my own opinion, is that you need to have a kind of a blend where you look at the Mick O'Dwyer time where they did hard running and then they did football. I, I still think you need that base of not mental laps now, like, but you need to do some bit of a base of conditioning before you start doing these small one set of games because, like, you could begin in January there and you're doing 1v1 inside the box and the body breaks down fairly quick and I suppose the first of the blame them is the strength and conditioning coach inside in the gym. Yeah, of course. But, um, you know, it's a learning curve. I think the, the game, and this, I think is, the J is going back to the more the skills of the game again, which is good to see. I know even Mike Crook wrote an article about it a few weeks ago there like, and he spoke about just like this football has been played as football again. You're going back to seeing 15-15. I think the blanket defences are gone now because Dublin really exposed it last year against Tyrone. Yeah. You know, you, you play, play the game wide and it's very hard to close down. Yeah, well, and obviously Tyrone no plan B, which was really weird to hear in the aftermath of that. You're, you're here today to talk about AOMFitness1.com, so which obviously is kind of uh, the conversation we've been having feeds nicely into this. Um, yeah. You have a new business. What's the story with this? Yeah, so myself and my cousin Michael, he's in England. Um, we set it up together and basically it came from, the, I suppose, the whole GA side. Is that Michael would have contacted me two years ago. Uh, he was playing out in London, playing football, and um, I suppose didn't have a gym program, really. Um, I suppose it's the debate about if, if you're inside in the county or if you're with, um, I suppose, development squads, that, that everything's laid out for you. Yeah. And some clubs, sometimes, like, so at that time he got on to me, I did up a program for him, and then we got talking about it. I was actually studying at the time, and uh, we got talking about it, and then it kind of snowballed on, snowballed on from there. And two years down the line, we went from, first of all, kind of concentrating on GA, like the drills and the warm-ups and your correctives and your exercises and the gym work, and then we went. We wanted to go into something that would, there'd be something there for everyone. That's the person that doesn't go to the gym or that someone that might have only a 45 minute window during the day and I wasn't going to open up a gym and obviously I wasn't going to open up a dancing school so <laughs> we said we'd go online and um, so we created uh, aomfitness1.com and um, we've launched it today and uh, it's it's something we're, we've are we a lot of work put into it and um, look it, it's, it's a learning curve really like, So who's it for? It's for everyone George. it's for as I said to you it's for every person that's into fitness, every person. It can be for a club team, county team, it can be from a team outside of Ireland, it can be from a person that has no interest in any football or anything like that and just wants to go to the gym and do a Tabata session or a stretching session or you have TRX sessions, you have everything and anything. Because so. it's intimidating for people who don't have that culture or who don't have a, um, who don't have a personal trainer or who don't have a whole heap of time. You walk into the gym and there's a lot of people doing stuff and they seem to know how to use all the machines and they seem to be on some kind of um, a program which they understand. Mm -hmm. uh, so for beginners, is it also for beginners? Yeah. So like you, for me, like um, the the biggest thing for our website was that 
someone asked me, I'd say about two weeks ago, they were there like, Asher, it's fine. Like you said there, it's fine for you. You know, you're with there with 14 years involved in exercise. Like, so it's no about you. What about the person that walks in off the street and has never gone to the gym? And I said, right. The only example I give that is, I said, have a look at me. I walked into a dance studio and I did it for 16 weeks. And I said, it was the most stressful thing in my life. And I said, fitness and everything had nothing to do with it. Or, do you know what I mean? As in, it was something totally different to me. So the website, when we were going through it, we wanted something like where you could do body weights at home that you can click on the website, it's free, you can subscribe to it, and when you subscribe, there'll be emails sent out to people every week, letting them know what's actually in the weeks ahead, what's coming along down the line. And for us then, it's maybe there's a person that doesn't want to go to the gym or doesn't have the time. I know myself, I have a young baby at home now, and if I'm up in the morning at six o'clock, I went to do a session for 45 minutes in the kitchen or in the hall or something, yeah. you just click into the website, it's there for you, click into whatever you want, body weights, the videos are there, I'm doing them, and everything you see, there's no editing or cutting or chopping or anything like that. It's what you see, and you'll see plenty of times I'll be making mistakes in it, I'll correct myself, and all the writing's underneath it, so it's there for them to see and to read back over it and go through it. And if, like as, as, as I said to Michael when we were doing it, if it works for one person, great. You know, some people might say, look, that's not for me, and then, you know, will and be it. Like, but it's, yeah. it's, it's their farm, like, yeah. They can switch it off if it's not yeah, for them. Exactly. That's the, yeah. Like, uh, yeah, I always love those people who shout at the radio, it's like, well, you can, there's an off button. Yeah, and exactly. There are other there are other stations that you can listen yeah, to. Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's fine. Um, so just to go back to the the, uh, the way that the game has developed, I'm always interested in. Um, I remember Rio Ferdinand talking about being. He, he did ballet for years and years and years, and he credits that with um, his athleticism and his particular ability to uh, to recover from situations that you know. Like, I, I kind of would have said Paul McGrath. I, if I if somebody told you Paul McGrath had done something other than play football in his life, the way he recovered from situations, you would definitely have said, "I understand that." And with Rio, when I heard that, I was like, "Oh, well, that makes a whole heap of sense." Would you recommend that um, sports people now do some form of dance or some form of gymnastics early in their career to kind of? even just to improve your footwork. Yes, yeah, so I, I, I would have gone to one of those classes, the ballet class last year, during the Dancing with the Stars. So it was for one of the, the video outtakes on a Sunday night. And I was amazed. And like, uh, you, you talk about football and like the pressures of like uh, performing on a big day and winning all Ireland. So you've these young people here in ballet, and I think they go out to Russia you know, to perform and try to break through. With like the flexibility and their mobility and their just like the, it's like they they have to be kind of broken down first and the mental toughness they get. Then yeah. you no, know, I I was there at night. I was kind of mortified leaving there because I could hardly lift my leg up over my shoulder. But I like, just watch them and the flexibility of them and just the passion they have for. It. Like when, when I finished the dance, even the professional dancers that were there, they spoke about the love for their art. And I was even thinking of there, looking back, I was saying, "Geez, I had, I had that much love for J when I was playing it," and it is. The, the dancing for me like you can I suppose I can look back and then I can have laugh about it as in you know there was plenty of stress and there was plenty of tough days and you were trying to pick up steps and yeah. your coordination isn't great but the fitness side of it and the fitness element like their mindset was if you didn't pick up something they'd say do it again and keep going and with Valeria she'd always say do it again I remember one, one of the days I think we were practicing in Killarney on the Wednesday and there was two steps very simple basic that I couldn't pick up and she kept saying, do it again, do it again. And I was kind of looking at her and I was saying, ah, oh, Jesus, I don't even want to be here now. And why am I here? And, this yeah. is, and she kind of left me have my meltdown, said nothing. And then and two days later, we were talking and I was there like, why didn't you say anything? She goes, ah, I just stayed here all night. She goes, until you got it. And it's that kind of mentality they drain into, like, and they don't give up. And it's, and, and the, the, the funny thing, and, it, and it's like, gee, you know, they leave you find your own way. Like, uh, I think a lot of the gee the last couple of years was like, everything was drilled into players where they were told to do this, do this, and if yeah. something happened differently on the pitch, then they were like, what do we do yeah. yeah. And so, like, I, I remember going out every Sunday night then, and Valeria would always say to me, if something happens, just keep going. And it's funny, the very first night that we went out in the live on, she was like, if something happens, keep going. And I remember I had to flick her down, she came down like this, and they threw up the two straps of the dress came out. I was like, oh, Christ. And I said, all I had in my head was, she said, keep going, so I'm going to keep going, or whatever happens. And they did like, so the mentality of the dancing and just everything that goes with it is it will be a big thing for G and I've no doubt give it a year or two like people will be sending him off to ballet and stuff like that yeah but it is interesting that like somebody who is who had access to some of the best training and conditioning in, in the country found that like hip flexibility and, and foot movement worked in a 12 week period and it improved and you know you know as a club footballer you felt better and faster yeah, so I'd have seen the video from week one to week 12 in the, the mobility of my hips. And when you, when you go in at the start of the dancing, 
and the judges be talking about your your hips and your there's no movement and you need your hips to move. I was kind of saying to myself, I couldn't see it as a J player. Like yeah. I was there, like like I'm and like the legs are toned and your hips are toned and you need to be toned for taking. Well, I suppose hits, hits. Yeah. And um, then week twelve, and I was looking at the video. I was even looking there a few weeks ago. Like like your hip is naturally moving. Like Rob Heffern now is a typical example this year from the walking. Like his amazing hips. You know the way you, you talk about now. Like his his mobility is. Is massive, like, and yeah. for, for G players, like, you have to have that balance now, like, that it's like having the strength, but at the same time, trying to get player. And I think a lot of it comes down to the player as well. That players love going to the gym, and I just myself lifting heavy weights, and you go and you get this great mental buzz from within. But the most important thing is you're stretching that five or ten minutes you have before and after. Do you do a formal? And I, I didn't do it myself, you know what I mean? When I was playing, like, I begin, you know, I show sure, I lift now. I remember one year doing uh, German volume, just like lifting 10 tens. Should come November, I was rounded like that. Yes, yeah. it's, it's like someone said to me, "Are you going running through walls or something?" And I was there. I took me about a year to get the the, the mobility and flexibility back in it. And it, it, they're they're kind of learning curves because you don't need it for J. You need strength. Yeah, but you need to have a balance like the the flexibility and like your power and stuff like that is a big thing that's coming into it. And more explosiveness, I would yeah. say, more often that it becomes yeah. a faster game. And um, so yeah, I don't know. It, it is interesting to see how that's going to go. Um, like the. The way that the game is going at the moment, um, is it as enjoyable to watch, do you feel? Um, I think for managers it's probably a great time because I think there's more thinking. It's like a game of snakes and ladders with the, the whole way teams line up. And it's very hard. And like, I was even looking at the, the Galway game this year, the galway Dublin game, and a lot of people spoke about coming to Galway's defensive setup wouldn't work against Dublin. And like... They weren't that very defensively, but they worked hard. But like, looking, I suppose, and this is me now as a retired player, it's very hard to play a kind of a running game for 70-something yeah. minutes because when you're playing Dublin and something like that, you need to play them in football. And you, you need to keep your, like, and I'd say, not keep your energy levels, but you need to have that kind of balance where, like, you're working hard, you're always on top. And that's why they've, they've, they're very athletic players. I think with the players they have as well, the Keno Sullivans, the Jack McCaffrey's, the James McCarthy's, they're natural athletes. As well, and then obviously you have Jim McConnell, like who's not back this year yet, like in, in the middle of them, and like the likes of Bernard Brogan to come back, and they've they have that winning mentality now as well. I think that if a team w- was to beat them, they would have it. Like if Mayo won, we'll say in All Ireland two years ago, when you when you win All Ireland, that mentality gets into where you're in games, then like, and you're a lot harder to be beaten. And Dublin have that because they've like the 2011 game against ourselves, and then the last two years there against Mayo, yeah. the Windows game, and, and they're, they're coming back every year. And I know myself when you win All Ireland. They say it's harder to come back the following year, but they have players coming in behind them, and they have younger lads like the likes of Conor Callan that are kind of coming in saying, "Right, I don't care whose jersey I'm taking, I'm going to take one of their jerseys." And I think the players realise that as well. They're regenerating as they go. Yeah. That's the yeah. that's the problem for the rest of the country. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then the other side in is that they have players there now. They have five hundred medals, and there's young lads coming in saying, "Right, this group of players mightn't come along for another ten years, or yeah. there might be two or three more years left in it." I want to jump on this bandwagon here. I'm going to give everything, and I want to win all Ireland as well, and be be in the same bracket as these players because in the last couple of years they they are the best team in Ireland without a doubt. And everyone's talking about them that they're going to, you know, surpass the the great Kerry Golden Year team. So like it it is a great time to be, I suppose, involved in football in Dublin at the moment. Here, um, obviously, you said you you're going in to watch the league matches. Are you interested in punditry? Are you, is that something that down the line you might get involved in, or do you actually not want to do it? It's not that I don't want to do it. Um, I was asked about this before, and I'll tell you 100% straight out now. Uh, I wouldn't do punditry because um, I was supposed punditry and writing articles might be two different things. The players I played with and the players I played with before, uh, it's great to, to meet them out in a social aspect or meet them out of the game and be able to look them in the eye and say, well, how things, and yeah. not knowing that I wrote something or I said something in an article or, or on a radio station here with yourself today that I cut the legs off of someone for to say can maybe get a few pounds and going down the road in the car I wouldn't yeah. do that that's not who I am and I, do, I, I don't want to be that person like there's a life outside that I love meeting people and you can have a conversation with them like I can walk in here to say to yourselves off the ball like and I don't worry <laughs> what did I say about Jordan a few weeks back or what did I say about the show yeah. and that's, that's who I am like no I'd rather have that friendship there and I've the one thing that when I retired and to this day I, I don't look back and say geez I'd lo- love to be still playing I have those bonding sessions where, as I say, we're up mountains and the things that we never speak about and you have those things and I don't want to be coming out telling stories that we did this and this fled the that. 
no, I, I'd rather be meeting the person for a cup of coffee. And is it just is it just because you played with the current crop, and that in five years' time, when they're gone, you'll be happy to cut the legs from some no, of the, I, the younger I, lads, or is it that whole aspect no, of it? I, I wonder because you know, I, like whether you like it or not, and I know myself playing, and especially in the last couple of years, you hear everything back, like this this kind of belief that the players don't hear things yeah. you always hear because someone someone wants to tell you in a someone like stupidly tags you, you in, know, in like or, or, yeah, or if. Like like that social media, it's the danger of social media now. Yeah. Like, and everyone is on social media. And I know myself. When I was playing, I made a decision that I'd never talk to the media, which, which I didn't, and I like, probably a nightmare. And I obviously, the <laughs> which for me it was a personal decision because Why? because like when I was getting on later in my life, like it wasn't like me being here with you now. And if we were talking about me Kerry playing Tipperary or Mayo and, or whatever in six weeks' time, what benefit would, would it be of me being here talking to you about the game? And there's something above me saying, right, man's 34 years of age, I know, I'll give him a good hose, you know, and voice. And that was my mentality, like, right. and every game I went out and then, even when I was 36 and a half, when I was playing that Dublin game dollar in the semi-final, I said, right, everything done, diet, food, as in training, everything was down to teen. I trained hard in the off-season and I was there. If you get beaten today, then you're beaten by a better player. And I never had to worry about, Jesus Christ. I gave him ammunition. Yeah, I, I said that to Joel Gill right there and off the ball, like, and next, all of a sudden, no, he's... He's going to use that to me, or no one has ever come back to me and said, Do you remember when you said that? Yeah. No, I've done plenty of things in the field where they've come back and said, You, well, you shouldn't have done that. I thought that maybe this would have been connected because you were like, you'd, you had controversies throughout your career at various stages, and mm -hmm. I thought that maybe it was a response to that. No, um, the controversies, Jesus, I don't know, I'd say moments of madness more than anything else. Like, I, I think there's a stage in your career, and, like, and this is only my own opinion, is that. Like when I when I came in two thousand three, like we were not in finals year after yeah. year. It was just a norm, and I, I don't mean that in a selfish way, no, or an arrogant way. But you know, it was every year, and it, it's like an expectancy then. And then when you're tr like, like and that would have been the culture you came into. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and like, say, and, and in Kerry, like as I said, you you were brought down very quick. Even when I f finished dancing, I'm back to work on a Tuesday, and like, and it was yeah. everyone asked me, did you find a hole in your life? And I said, no, it's parked straight away because you learn fairly quick down there. Yeah, you were only as good as your last game or your last appearance. So like for me, that time it was like. When I was starting, then like I was kind of saying, Jesus, you know, things happen in games. I remember the, the league final against Dublin, and like I wouldn't make any excuse. I remember I got sent off that game, and it was the centenary year or whatever. It was, it was one of those years, and I was, I remember, I think, was, I think Kieran Kenny ran across me, and then someone else ran across me, and ran to Johnny Cooper, and he went down, and I was there, like in a split second, like these things happen in a split second, and I was there looking, I was there, oh god, next the flag was up on the side, and I was there, I think it was Joe McQuillan as well, I knew Joe wouldn't put down the flag in a, nothing against Joe, but um, yeah, the flag was up by Joe, and I'm an amazing man to spot these things, and um, I was there, and next I was the referee, I said, ah, Jesus, I said, I was checked twice, I said, if not three times, and the pocket was rummaging fairly quick, so I knew what was coming, like, and I remember being snapping again, and looking back on it, you know, yeah, it was it was a big disappointment for me. I, I took those things very tough, and um, you know because you let your team down, you let your family down as well because your family are sitting inside in the crowd like, and they're, they're yeah. getting the stick of it because you're you're standing on the pitch, and you're you're off and you're very selfish and you're trying to think in your own head like, you know, why do you do it and stuff like that. And, I so, uh, and what what is the answer? Like, so did you ever find an answer? Because like the um, the incident against Cork in yeah, the semi final. Yeah. I don't know. I like. I just think. At the time, obviously, my football, I, I don't know, is it that I was, not, not that I was struggling in football, but I don't know, it's maybe that you're in that environment constantly, that you're, not that you're in the limelight or anything like that, like, but you're just constantly there, like, and you're you're there to be, not got at, like, I'm not saying, oh, that you're got at in social media and stuff, because like, that time there wasn't. Can I put but, it to you, though, that I, I'd say that zero, num the number of your teammates who came up afterwards and went, you shouldn't have done that was zero, right? Am I right? Yeah, 100%. Yeah. So, like, actually... In that environment, it is, it's not supposed to be win at all costs because it's just supposed to be sport. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, you yeah. guys and your team didn't get involved so that, yeah, you got, you got one of the Cork lads sent off. Happy days. Oh, we go. And we're in the final. They're not. Right? Mm -hmm. Isn't, that's the team mentality? Yeah. Well, like, the, I'm not defending it. No, I'm just no, saying, no, that, I'm no, just no, saying like, that that's the culture. It, it was in the team. Sure. Look, Ger I know myself by their reaction after like this. They were disappointed in myself. Like, so... Um, but I'm like, sure they were messing at, with their training the next night. Of course, it's like, that was it. It's still going. I mean, we played Tyro on the final. The in final. There was more fellas slapping themselves across the face and throwing themselves <laughs> in the ground in front of me, and trying to, I'd say, ignite me more than anything else. But um, like I remember that game and that game, and after like Dunnick got sent off, and two minutes later, I remember Graham came straight down to the middle. I was just standing still until like a basketball game. He ploughed me, and the referee was like, the referee copped that stage, and he gave him penalty. No. I came out and I apologised. I put my hand up straight away after, and Dunnick got back for the what to call it, the replay. I remember we were marking each other, it was a great thing above in Dublin, there was a great buzz, the two lads, 
and the name was called out on the big boo. And what did uh, he say to you? Nothing, nothing. That nothing. Was, he didn't, nothing really was, because did you like, shake hands before the game, even, or was there uh, like? Look back, I think we did. Like, and, yeah. and just for me, like, uh, I parted him because I know myself. Like, um, Jordan, like, there's there's things you do in your life and stuff like that you're not happy about and you're not proud of. But like, you you can't. Kind of be, it's still a game at the end of the day, and there's yeah. m- there's more things happening in life now than something like GA and stuff like that. Like, so yeah, the Sunday game that night though obviously didn't spare you. And stuff like that can't yeah. be easy to watch. Um, no, and I think for me, I I made myself watch it. So you don't want to do it again. Yeah. And, like, and, like, and the other side of now, and I'm not defending myself here, there's 101 things that have happened to me in a football pitch where it's gone the other way, where fellas have thrown themselves on the ground and this and that has happened. And like You learned it from Tyrone, is what you're saying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not Tyrone. Blue stop. They're, they're like, we're now in Tyrone, <laughs> so we keep it that way. But no, no, like, and it's, it's happening the, the whole time. Like, and look, it's, it's, as I said, it's, it was something I wasn't proud of, but look, I parked it. It happened. Like, I wasn't going to ch- go back and rewind yeah. the time. And as I said, I came out and made a public apology about it. And, and the moment, like, so look, people do stuff in the heat of the moment that isn't great. And uh, yeah. if you own it, I think generally mm-hmm. people get over it relatively quickly. Yeah. Oh, it's, until, it's, it's until always like me bringing up 20 it's years always, yeah, like they were saying that I def- the dancing definitely suited me because I was a bit soft as well. Like, but, um, yeah, look, you have to see, it, and I'd be well able to look for my job as well. I'm a guard, like, so you get stick the whole time, and um, if if you do something, you must be able to take it as well. Like, and yeah. that's why, like, you, you brought up the asthma, um, the salbutamols. Mm-hmm. I didn't know you were a, a chronic asthmatic um, yeah. all your life through, and like that, the whole system of drug testing in the GA isn't something that the GA has ever really fully dealt with or understood yeah. or felt very comfortable with mm-hmm. I know that most players actually feel like it's you know we're amateur players and we shouldn't be tested and then on the other side the GPA look for grants from the uh, from the government so there's that whole thing but like to be in the middle of one of those stories must be like ah oh, Jesus Christ I can only imagine like normally we're really hard on drug stories on the show as you know as everybody uh, knows yeah, but yeah, like yeah. Um, I didn't know you the, had uh, chronic the, asthma the way it came out that, that was my biggest disappointment um and like I can, I can see it. it's, it's the way social media and stuff has gone now. The way it came out was Aidan Manny was plastered in front of the papers. Oh, man, he failed drug test. There's nothing about an inhaler in because obviously he wouldn't sell the story. Yeah. So that's and like I've I've buried it now. And like I, I text people about it like because like people that you'd know and that you'd say like that would have time for you, kind of put it in front of a paper saying oh man, he failed drug test. And like and I, I that time I was a guard blowing cork and next all of a sudden people were saying to him, you need to write out something here. And I remember the day the day it came out, I was saying to myself, Right, I'm asthmatic and next to everyone's gone with salbutamol and I was there like right to salbutamol and inhaler and next It's called this, a salbutamol inhaler. Yeah, my my so kids like, run it. Yeah, so like, like th- this was the the whole side of it then like and um like the last stories that went out never covered the whole inhaler thing. It was just oh man, he fails drug tests yeah. in front of a paper and next so papers delivered into the guard stations and stuff like that and next all of a sudden it's fierce talk so I remember that day I finished work at 2 o'clock and the story broke I went to bed for an hour and I woke up and the snore of light there was I think it was 102 missed calls on my phone and I had some, I don't know 80 or 90 messages people saying do you want to meet for coffee or do you want to yeah. talk about this you should talk to this person you should talk to that person and I was there like Jesus what's going on they're thinking here? that you're like on yeah. something yeah, yeah and, like, and like at that time I was only thinking my family was kind of thanks, like, thanks lads for assuming yeah, it's, that, it's like, for that, like, right. you know, good, <laughs> good publicity travels fast yeah, but fine. um then, like, obviously, I'm totally for the, the drug testing in, in the GA, but this was dragged out for six months, and then the people... Why, said, why did it take so long? Like, what? I, I think as well that because there's no track record and there's no history of dealing with stuff, mm. county boards are very protective instead of, like, if, if there was somebody to advise you and if you were to advise somebody again the next time, yeah. I suspect the first thing you would do is issue a public statement and say... This is, these are the full facts and I'm willing to talk to anybody about it under yeah. any circumstances. But I suppose from my side and I suppose from the Kerry County Board like, they, were, they were 100% supportive like, and you know you're, it's one thing trying to come out to tell someone about the inhaler and stuff like that but like are they going to write that story then saying oh Ed Mahoney came out there and said this inhaler we'll, we'll quench this no because there was a problem and it went on for six months and I remember City above these things I remember coming up from Kerry and going I think to the Crown Plaza Hotel and paying 50 euros for a room to get changed and myself to go in and sitting down, I'm kind of saying, what's going on here today? Next, there's this whole kind of lab again about this regulation, that regulation. Is this all with the Sports Council? Is that the... The, sport, the Sports Council, like, I knew the Kerry G, and I think it was Packy Durham was representing me. He'd, um, he was from Cork. And everything was going over my head. Like, and I'm a guard, like, and I know, like, laws and stuff like that. Next, it was going over my head, and I was kind of saying, what's going on here? And in the finish, I won't say it was a farce, but, like, it went on for so long, and there was so much media attention about it, and then it just kind of blew over, and everyone said, oh, yeah, that um, Aidan Manny was cleared and nothing to answer for and 
and I kind of say to myself, well, because you all did at the start. And I didn't mean that in a, an arrogant way or no way like that. But it was in retrospect, would you do something differently now? Or if somebody was in your same situation and they phoned you, would you say, oh, don't worry, the system will look after you over a period of time? Or would you say, get out in front of the story? You're, you're, you're like... Once you can defend yourself, you need to get out there straight away. Yeah. And, I, and that's me saying, oh, well, because looking back at that time, it went on for so long and so long. And then it's thrown your face in every game. And, you know, like... And People always went, uh, Yeah, right. and it was constant. And, like, and every time I was working and stuff, and you would say, oh, sure, your man's on drugs there. Right. You know, this kind of carry. And, like, yeah. like, like, I'm well able to defend myself now, and I'm, like, as in, like... But actually, at some point, we all have a breaking point, and yeah, if you hear yeah, stuff enough, yeah. it's going to... And, like, I gnashed one of these... Uh, fellas that play as a PT Carvering, but that thing was just, it went on for so long, it's just unraveling and unraveling, and like every week there was something to meet it. Every, every week there was something to meet it. And then Were finished, you advised not to speak or not allowed to speak? or I just didn't say it in Jordan because I didn't know really what the the whole kind of thing was about. And obviously, I knew the Salbutamol and stuff, and the inhaler and that that side of it, but this case is beyond so. It was like, yeah. it's, it's like if you're in a court case that. You're not allowed to talk about it outside and stuff like that. And look, we're naturally all suspicious because yeah. everybody who watches all sport all the time is mm. like, well, most sport is corrupted. But yeah. like, if you've got a legitimate, I am on an inhaler, I've been asthmatic all my life, mm. here's my inhaler, look at what it says in the thing. Like, yeah. you know. Yeah, but I suppose from the per- people looking in then, they wouldn't know about it, they'd be like, right, what's that beautiful, and what's this? And we all need to do a bit of education, it's definitely, and unfortunately, the first few cases are always the ones that everybody does a bit of learning on. Yeah, and, like, and as you said there, I'm totally for drug testing in the GA because, like, yeah, it's an amateur sport, but like you, you want to be treated as a professional as well. Yeah, and, and that's the way to go. Like, and I think it's it's great. Like this, like I remember that day, that's that's I think it was two and a half hours trying to give a urine. That's the that, that's probably the only thing that I go against. Like straight after the game, the All Ireland semi final against was a car in two thousand eight. It's two and a half hours, three hours inside trying to give a urine sample. Yes, yeah, I drank fun. about five liters of water, and I was I remember coming home. In the in the in actually, I missed the bus in the train home. Like and down the van with Nilo Cal and Botty, we call him. He's involved with the carry team there the whole time. And uh, I'd say I stopped about twenty times going on the road. <laughs> yeah, you know, like so. I had a pain in my head. And I, I'd say I was. I'd say rehydrated for about a week after it. <laughs> but yeah, it was about three. And I, I know players. Yeah. This goes, and I know obviously. I mean, they have to do it then because obviously the half life of a lot of stuff that you could take that would impact yeah. it, I, unless they would just all agree to some kind of blood prick and that you know. And, and it's and it's harder now because like the 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 protein shakes and all the tablets they're on, you know, all these yeah. caffeine and stuff, and you're there after, and you're trying to go, oh, what am I know, and yeah. you're writing out a list, you yeah. know, like, and, and you're after playing a game, and you're thinking, right, if you won, great, or if you lost, the last thing you want to be doing is yeah. going in there saying, oh, Jesus Christ, you're inside now with the winning, two winning players from the other side. Yeah. Like, well, I think it was you're after two years again like that, and you're inside, and you're after losing all and final, you're inside waiting to give a your yeah. sample. So. No fun. But More look, it's part and parcel of it, like, so... I guess the last thing that then is that well, I started off by joking about you know you're the dancer, but actually it's a really good thing for people to do to have a second thing in the mind of the public. So cause, uh, uh, there's been so much talk about the athletic identity of the mm-hmm. person and them being so bound up in it. You as a footballer had to break that. Not that you'll never mm-hmm. be anything other than a former Dance. Kerry footballer, <laughs> <laughs> but like. Do you know what I mean? I, I'm getting yeah. at your, you know, the core of your identity has always been a very single thing in the mind of the public, and now you're like you're free from that in a way if you want to be. Yeah, and, and it's you know it's something that was said to me. It was actually Denise, my wife, said it to me. We were talking about one time when I finished playing football, and it, I was actually in the middle of the dancing at the time, and it, it, I think I don't think it came out, it had come out that I was actually going in the dancing. Um, I was going to say competition, the dancing show, we'll say, and she said something like this, you know. You know, it's 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 after football that people. What will people know you for after football? What will you be known for after football? That's what people wonder. Do you know, as in, what will you do after that? People will wonder what what you did, and that's what you'll be known for. And it stuck in my mind. And when the dancing thing came up, when I was contacted about the first, I was there like, not a hope in life. I was saying to myself for the first three weeks, said, not a hope. And then something inside me, you know, I said, why not? Like it's everything that you're not, and it's everything that you wouldn't do. And like I'd be quiet, and people would know me. Look, I wouldn't bother people or. Stuff that I do my own things, and um, it just came to me, and I just said, "Why not?" No, after the first day going back up there and coming back down the road, I was there. Well, you were some donkey, like for even even thinking about it, because we were up there the first day, and you have this big long kind of catwalk thing, and you're doing the long, the promo video. And I go up, and next day put me into this tux and green thing, dicky bow, and there's about two hundred people down there, more uh, film studios, and you've all the we'll say the professional dancers and you have the 12 people that were actually take, or 11 people that were taking part in the show as well and look around they're all there who are you and I said oh 
Kerry Aidan Mandy and uh, Jay. So there was a British producer there in the next he was there and where's the the gag guy? He goes he's not even Jay, the gag guy, he goes, he must go up for I need to go home early like and I was there I said Mira and he was there like um you need to go up there in the catwalk and he said the lights will be on he said we'll put on a song and you need to dance and I was there um, I said I can't dance well he said you better learn quick and I said well I said the whole part of me taking part in this show was to learn how to dance this is my mindset he was there who told you that so I got up on the catwalk and then I, like, there was about 200 people watching me and it, it felt like 10,000 because I was there it was sweat coming down my back and all that thing and I kept I was cursing myself I was like you donkey like what's your wet here so I came down next I just made a run at it and kicked up in the air and he's, I remember the camera was way up he just came out laughing. He was like, oh my God, he goes, that's a big thing to follow now. And I was there like, what do you mean? He was like, that flexibility. And he goes, that, that kick thing. He goes, we've never seen something like that. And I just came off the stage. I got into my car and I remember ringing Denise saying, I'm not coming back up. I said, this is totally outside my zone altogether. Like, she started laughing like, and then just got into it. And I remember I talked to Dale Scale after and he was there. In about two weeks now when they start nominating our naming, who's in it, they'll be talking about Z listers and this. And I was away on holidays the next like I could see social media and dancing with the there's no stars in this and all this kind of thing which is great and like it's it's it was a, it was mentally a great thing because yeah you get so much stick like i remember the semi-final the young lad dale was was sent home and like we got on great and we were living together for the 12 weeks now i was up and down to work and everything and like he just got very emotional on on, on the main screen and for the semi-final now they probably i should have been sent home before him being honest about it like and um he got sent home and he got very emotional on TV and I was standing up here like just looking at him and I was like, oh Jesus Christ, I'm going to get absolutely tortured on social media. And the next day I came out, how did the man he's staying in? That's the GA vote and all this. And, you know, I was looking back and I was saying, you know, it's kind of, it was an entertainment show. Yeah. And you can get it carried away with it. Now, we had a baby in week nine, like, so it kind of brings it back down to earth. Yeah, it. totally. That, I mean, there that's one life-changing event and then there's the other life-changing event of being a dad. That's like, mm. uh, yeah. which, you know, you don't, Maybe you don't have that much time for when you're uh, uh, in the bubble of being a self-obsessed Gaelic footballer. Yeah. And actually, it's good to get out of that. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I, th- I think that, like, I look back now and I'm thinking to myself, if I had the baby during the, the time of the football, because I see Mark O'Shea and all these lads had kids, and I, I'd say you take your hats off to him because you're up in the morning, like, at six o'clock and stuff. And Parenting you know, is hard. It is. My wife's in uh, the Middle East this week at work, and uh, I'm at home parenting on my own. Like, so, but single, like, single parenting is the hardest thing in the world. <laughs> Yeah, so like it, it is, it's, it's, a, it's a great thing. AOMfitness1.com if anybody wants to, uh, to get on a programme. No matter what state of life you're at, if you're like a, a team or an individual, if you're a committed gym bunny, if you're a starter outer. There's something for everyone. As I said, I think the, the biggest thing is the challenges and there's plenty of stuff coming down that we haven't put up on the website yet. So if they subscribe, leave their names, it's all free. Just subscribe, leave their emails. They'll know what's coming up the online and there is, there is some very interesting things. Uh, twinkle toes, great stuff. <laughs> Thank you, Jeremy. Hey, hope you enjoyed that latest offering from Off The Ball. If you want to subscribe, and you should, check out just up here. All our latest stuff is just down here. Generally, knock yourself out.